name is Martina Queen, and I am a member of this congregation and your worship associate this morning. We want to welcome you to First Unitarian Church of Honolulu. We are a Unitarian Universalist community inspired by our principles, boldly growing compassion, justice, and joy. We are very busy, and this is a very vital community. Uh, announcements of upcoming and current events are posted on our website on Fridays. But if you do not have access to the internet, uh, you can get a hard copy at the greeter's desk. Uh, please pick one up before you leave. If you find anything that you are interested in attending, you are most welcome. I do have a few announcements from the front this morning. The worship team is still looking for people who are interested in learning how to work the audiovisual equipment for the morning, Sunday morning services. The more people we can get trained, the less often you will need to volunteer. So if you are interested in getting that training, please see Jennifer, our minister, or Dennis Grau, our pianist. The Social Justice Council will begin to collect canned goods and non-perishables for the Hawaii Food Bank 2014 food drive. Their goal is 300 cans uh, of meat, meals, soups, vegetables, and fruits. So feed a family, bring your cans to church. Uh, you can leave off your donations at a table set up in the gallery, and that is happening today through April 6th. If you have any questions, see Susan Lebo. The mission of Unitarian Universalism is to address the social isolation and rootlessness characteristic in modern life and to minister to the hurts and hopes of those in our community and to radically define our community beyond our membership borders, seeking to bring other people who need our support into our churches and into our lives. You are all most welcome. Please say the words of the chalice lighting with me as the Reverend Jonathan Kwong lights the chalice. We light this chalice with members of compassion. We light this chalice with the torch of justice. We light this chalice with the radiance of joy. I want to invite the children down, and if there's any children in the back or visitor children, come on up. Downstairs this month, all the grown-ups have been talking about technology, and that includes today. So our children's story today is using not a book and not pieces of paper, but we're going to use the technology today. So who can tell me what this is? What is that? It's an iPad. Who can tell me? What is this? An uh, Xbox. It's an Xbox. <laughs> Who can tell me of the kids? What's this? Phone. The phone. Who can tell me? What's this? Hulu son. What's Hulu? It's a company. What, what do you watch through Hulu? I like TV shows on the internet. <laughs> Who can tell me? Ooh, what's this? Or what do you think this could be? Oh, I think it's a bracelet. <laughs> it could be. Oh, it's a bracelet for your wrist to listen to music. And you can put the earphones in, and then that's how you could get your music. Okay, we're going to get harder. What's this? <laughs> Nothing? <laughs> Emily, what do you think this is? <laughs> oh, it's a cash register. I used that growing up at my grandparents' bar. You had to do all the math in your head. <laughs> and it went cha-ching, cha-ching, cha-ching. What's this? <laughs> what do you think, Zap? <laughs> not a CD player, not a... 
it's a slide projector for putting pictures, slide pictures in and showing them on the screen. One at a time. What's this? It is a tape for like music. What's that? <laughs> Blank stairs. It's a computer desk for saving all your computer information on. Long time ago. <laughs> kind of like a flash drive. <laughs> What's this? Oh, it's Pong. Pong was an early video game. It was around when I was little. And you, you had to hook it up to your TV and you had to wait till your dad was in a good mood. <laughs> and then he'd come hook it up and he, that's all you did. You had a, a line and your friend had a line and you bounced the ball for hours. So, there's some changes in technology, yeah? Tell me how you would find out, if you needed for your school report to find out the capital of Pakistan, how would you find out? Internet. Would you go to the encyclopedias at the library when the library's open? No, go to the internet. <laughs> what if you need to learn, how do I know if I'm spelling that word correctly? Technophile. Dictionary. Okay, where do you, where's your dictionary at your house? My dad's phone. <laughs> <laughs> so true. What if I want to find out what time the next RE meeting is at church, because I need to be at the meeting? Emily, how would I do that? Look on the church website. Look on the church website. Would I like call the office between noon and four and see if Jen could find it on the calendar? No. <laughs> no. <laughs> right. I'd look in the church newsletter online. What if what if I have a new niece, a new baby on the mainland and I want to see what she looks like? How do I find out? Do you know um, Elijah, do you know how I'd find out? No? What do you think, Luke? Text. Yeah, they could text me a picture. Would they like write me a letter, take a picture, get it developed at Long's, put it in an envelope, mail it to me? Just Lou's looking at me like, what? what? Do pictures at Long's? What if I want to see what time my favorite TV show is on? Do I like get the TV guide delivered to my house? No. no. I don't even have the time my show is on. I'm going to watch my show at 9 o'clock that's on my DVR, right? I don't care that my show was on at 7.30 on Tuesday. <laughs> and do you have any idea how to put the pictures in this PowerPoint that I did? Do you have, yeah. <coughs> you do, Bodhi? How old are you? <laughs> Bodhi's three. <laughs> awesome. <laughs> and then what about if I'm driving someplace new? How do I get directions? How about like an atlas? I could get it off the shelf and I could open it. A map. Okay, a map. Like maybe on my phone I'd get a map. Okay. So this was in a child's day, a little small, but on the, uh, the citation, oh, there's a citation at the bottom on a tech addiction website. But in a kid's day, in 24 hours, an average five to eight year old is spending about seven hours at school and about nine hours sleeping and one hour eating and three hours doing other things and three hours on screen time. Things with screens at your house are like what? Your TV. Yeah. Your computer. Your computer, your iPad, your phone. Yeah. And then how much time reading books? It says like 20 minutes up there, yeah. And let's see here. Who's two to five years old? Okay, and who knows how to play a computer game? Kind of like all the two to five year olds. Who is, who can swim without a life jacket on? <coughs> Anybody. Okay, so that's like half of you. Who can, if I said go open the internet on the computer over there, who could do that? Okay, a little bit more. They do. Who can, who's the two to five? Owen and Bodie and Emily. Who can tie your shoelaces out of the three of you? You're older though. Not the three-year-olds. Who can play a game on your mom's phone? Oh, probably all three of them can do that. 
And Emily and Bodie are two to three years old. Who can ride a bike? Emily and Bodie, can you ride a bike? Not all by yourself, maybe. And who can play a computer game? Yeah, so more kids can play computer games than ride bikes. Does the computer help you? Sometimes. Sometimes, not all the time. So something to think about, this is the last slide here, that the ways that we find information now, and the ways that we relax for fun, and the ways that we talk to our family, and even the ways that we worship at church are changing. And then I want you to think about what works for you. And that's some of the stuff the grown-ups are going to be talking about today. So if you like using screen things, stand up. Okay. And if you like using computers for different things, let's go upstairs to class. <laughs> All right, let's make a bridge and sing our children off to their classes. by Beth Martin on the wall of the Church of the Larger Fellowship, which is the online Unitarian Universalist Church, and which boasts to be the largest Unitarian Universalist Church in the United States. Beth writes about the services. If you arrive at the worship site early, you'll hear music. Other people are gathering as well and chatting just like real church. <laughs> People greet each other with short typed messages. Once the worship actually begins, the chat continues, but the conversation is focused on the service. There's a time for joys and concerns. Frequently there's a question you can respond to, and there's even a chance to sing along with the hymns. Exclamation point. <laughs> After the service is over, People linger, saying goodbye, wishing everyone a good week, etc. Hope you can join us! Exclamation point. <laughs> Today we meet in this place with a compassionate and understanding heart toward one another. Today we enjoy the spiritual nourishment of compassionate, questioning, inclusive, and joyful arms. May light and love surround us and guide us to right action. May this sanctuary be illuminated by the light of love. And together we say, may we go out with good courage, not knowing where we go, but trusting that the chalice of love, which burns in our hearts, will guide us and support us wherever we go and whatever challenges we need. So I certainly hope that as you left after last week's service, that that challenge of meeting the language of the next generation didn't drive you out of here wanting to hit the panic button. I hope that you came out of here renewed and inspired in the great opportunity that lies ahead of us as we reach out to the Google generation. <laughs> so, you may be asking, where did, where did you come up with this title to begin with, and what does it mean to live in an age of Google? So today we're gonna be talking about a theology or a theology of Google. So some of you, when you saw this on the printed on the order service or on our website, you may have thought, oh, that's kind of a clever name for it. The at Logi.com. I wonder what that sermon is gonna be about. So here's a hint actually, in that um, it's actually a shorthand way of talking about both theology and theology. Because here in our congregation, we don't think that 
that which we describe as divine is necessarily limited to the male pronoun or the male gender. We realize that um, the divine spirit is both female and male and omnigender. So that's why we coined this term, or I coined this term, that I'm now calling theology. All right? So when I refer to that, you'll know what I'm talking about. Here's what my seminary professor, Philip Clayton, had to say about it. Because a, a couple of years ago, he actually gave a lecture at my seminary called Theology After Google. And he says, oh, that's a long slide. It's not here. All right. He says a bunch of wonderful stuff about the fact that this group of people whom I'm describing as those who are the later part of the Generation X folks and the Millennials, primarily, yeah? So Millennials are those who are 18 to 29, and Generation Xers are before that. So I happen to arrive kind of on the latter part of the Generation X culture. That these folks, especially the Millennials, did you know that the Millennials make up 72% of those who describe themselves as being spiritual but not religious. In, in other words, these are the folks who are fed up with institutionalized religion that tries to shove dogma down their throat and tries to shove creeds and doctrine down their throat. And so they have decided that they are no longer going to be affiliated with that and therefore, they are also known as the nuns, the N-O-N-E-S, that they describe themselves as not having a certain religious affiliation. And so, as we could see, um, it's not necessarily just folks who belong in that age category. So I don't want to be accused of being ageist and just targeting a specific group of people, neglecting um, the others who are maybe not of that age, all right? Because certainly, even folks like Deborah Von Upson, who is older than me, are in many ways more technologically advanced than I am and have gotten a hold of the language of Google. And so certainly this movement and this revolution that we're talking about of social media applies to more than just this certain generation. So this morning I want to talk about what are some of the characteristics of Google agers, all right? So the first thing I want to point out is that these folks actually have a theology of inclusivity. So I don't know how many of you noticed, but when Putin was spouting off a bunch of hateful stuff right before the Winter Olympics, Google decided to change its logo. A multicolored world with multicolored athletes, yeah, and isn't this indeed what our values are as Unitarian Universalists? Are we not the folks who say that y'all are welcome, no matter who you are, whether you're an atheist or, an, or, or, or a theist, you're welcome here. Whether you're a Republican or a Democrat, you're welcome here. Whether you're a service member or you're a pacifist, you're welcome here. Whether you prefer briefs or boxers, you are welcome here. And even vegans and carnivores are somehow welcome all in one place. We have a large enough umbrella to say that everyone is welcome here. Yet, how does this actually work out in practice? Now, in some ways, I'm actually a little envious of fundamentalist megachurches. You know why? Ask me why. Why? why? Thank you. Um, I would have told you anyway if you didn't ask, but it was nice of you to ask. Um, the reason is that ever notice how intentional they are about reaching young people? I bet if you look at their budget, you would see that they invest heavily in building up their technology infrastructure. I bet if you look closely enough, you'll notice that there's so many after-school programs that are targeted toward young families that it would put all of us to shame if we, if we compared our budget one to another. So for those reasons, I feel like we're kind of behind the eight ball on this one. That somehow what we're trying to do 
hasn't necessarily kept up with what evangelical churches are trying to do. And it's no wonder that their churches are bursting at the seams with younger people who are into rock music and into all these other ways of expressing their faith. Although, I must tell you, that is beginning to dwindle. Because more and more young people, we found this out during the special session, right, are beginning to find out that their theological values does not necessarily align with the churches that they belong to. That even though the form looks hip and contemporary, the theology goes back way over to the dark ages and the middle ages. And so these days, evangelicals too are experiencing attrition. And did we read that um, recent polling that was done even among Republican youth? that the majority of them support marriage equality. So they should be coming over to our side, yeah? We should be throwing our doors wide open for them, saying, you are welcome here. And secondly, a theology of Google is one that takes a look at a both and perspective. So just as I mentioned before, that I'm not really excluding those from another generation, I want us to be able to take a look as well as how could we come up with a both and solution to it. Similar to how we have both the order of service printed out, we have 30 copies in the back if you want one, or we have it in the e-blast, and you're more than welcome to follow along on our worship service on our screen, or pick up a hymnal before the service. You can pick up the newsletter via email, or we'd be happy to print it to you if you're a member of this congregation. So there are various both and ways so that everybody can have access to our salvific message, all right? The one way that I've noticed that our denomination and our faith has been doing this is through our seminaries. So traditionally, people who are called to ministry are required to give up three years of their lives and suffer the cold weather of Chicago by going to meet the Lombard or even the Bay Area, where the temperature dips into the 50s, <laughs> just so that they could have a theological education and become UU ministers. But these days, there's something called modified residency, so that their work can be done both online, so people could actually do their coursework online, and there's an opportunity for folks to gather together in either of these seminaries during um, the winter break, or during the summertime, or during times when um, you know it doesn't have to be the whole year, but they could do it in bits and pieces and in five chunks, all right? So both and is the second one. The third way that I feel like um, we could connect to a theology of Google is by taking a look at what it actually has to offer us. And again, we may have disagreements with Joel Osteen's theology, but the Huffington Post actually came out with an article on May 9th of 2013 that is entitled, Click, Pray to Pray, How Evangelical Mega Pastor Joel Osteen is Saving Souls with Facebook. So Joel Osteen has a Facebook like and a Facebook following of 3.6 million people. That is three times more than Justin Bieber and 16 times more than the White House. So no matter how much we may complain about him or his ministry, that is a lot of people he is reaching. Now I'm gonna encourage you to go check out, go Google this article on the Huffington Post um, if you want to, but um, needless to say, um, this article talks about the fact that there are so many hungry people out there yearning for connection, yearning for someone to pray with them. And you know what some of these people's issues are? They're issues like, my relative has stage four cancer. Can you pray with me? I can't go back home right now, and I'm scared to go back home because if I did, my boyfriend will beat me up and I suffer from domestic abuse. And you know what um, these folks from Joel Osteen's ministries do? 
they don't just say, we'll pray for you, but they also say, here's the number for the women's shelter or the, or the hotline that you could call in order to get help. And I'm sitting here thinking, why can't we be as proactive in our pastoral care outreach? There is a hurting and a dying world out there. We, as Unitarian Universalists, do care about you, and we do want to be on this journey with you as well. How can we do that so that our reach and our impact in our community would reach 3.6 million souls? That's the challenge that I have in front of us today. And it's no matter whether we want to connect in real time or connect in cyberspace, we Unitarian Universalists ought to be able to figure out how to do that. Because remember, we are the radical revolutionaries. Are we not? Are we not the rabble rousers to transform our community out there? Yes. So yes. what are we doing sitting behind these safe pews? We should be out there in the community and we should, number four, be the beta church. Now what do I mean by being the beta church? Here's what Phil Clayton has to say. One of the greatest insights of the Google world is the freedom of beta. A beta is more than a product not yet ready for consumption, but a way of thinking, creating, and living. It owns being unfinished. It expects contribution, evolution, and transparency. Aren't we the ever-evolving religion out there? If we weren't, we'd be stuck in 15th century theology still. But no, we kept saying out there that we want to be relevant. We want to be the religion that answers, not, a, not, not, an, not necessarily answers all your questions, but we are the religion that wants to journey on your questions with you, and we are the religion that has a high tolerance for ambiguity. Because we know that we don't live in a freaking black and white world, do we? We live in a world that is ambiguous. And so how can we be that religion? Well, one example of this, again, I invite you to go back home and Google it if you want to, is a new endeavor called Beloved Cafe. And its tagline is to brew justice, to pour love, and to serve life. And this is a spiritual community for the nuns. The whole idea around this is that you can have church in a coffee house. You can have church in a bar. You can have church at Island Pacific Academy. You, church is where the people are. And it's wherever people are there to ask questions of each other and to be there for one another and to have that spiritual presence and provide nourishment for each other. That is what a beloved cafe is all about. Can we be as adventurous and engage in experimentation? Instead of being the 1.0 or the 2.0 or the 3.0, can we always be on beta mode so that we are constantly relevant to our time? Was that number four? Mm. Who's counting, right? Mm. Number five, number five of a spirituality of Google is can we be a search engine for people who are on a quest for meaning. Can you imagine what that would look like? Let's face it, folks. We are constantly bombarded with so much information and Facebook posts and so much text messaging and emails every single day. I get about 100 emails a day, all right? And these aren't even just junk mails. So these are emails that require my attention. And when I get on the Facebook, uh, on my Facebook account, there's a bunch of people that also require my attention. Sometimes I find out about things via Facebook quicker than I do in real life. Um, and so how are we responding in a rapidly changing world and as we are bombarded with information? How many of you get overwhelmed sometimes with the amount of data that you receive, amount of uh, forwards and posts that you receive. Yeah, I know I do. And we have a society out there that needs us 
to be that search engine. And you want to know what filter we use? It's called the seven principles. So while the, 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 the results might come up with one million possibilities and links that we could go to, if we apply the seven principles, maybe we could narrow it down to one page after we do our search. To do it, to, to phrase it differently in old school terms, imagine us, the church, as a giant highlighter <laughs> saying, pay attention to me. This is what's important in life. And so we find, found this out with PIO, with the Progressive Interfaith Ohana. There are so many social justice issues out there. How can we narrow it down so that it would be in line with our values and our principles? How could we highlight it so that, for example, we could just work on something like the Charter for Compassion, and the good news about that is it's already introduced in our legislature. We already have two resolution numbers for it. We're just chomping and waiting at the bit so that we could um, testify and submit um, written testimonies to our legislators to let them know that this is the basic needs and this is the basis for Unitarian Universalist values and principles in that we want to be able to become a compassionate state. Isn't that a way of highlighting what is important in our lives? Thank you, Karimi. I'm glad one person thinks so. So to, um, I know you want me to end this sermon already, but um, let me just say that a theology of Google is about men and women who live in and are molded by a very different era than the Eisenhower civil rights, Vietnam, or even baby boomer eras. Those who walk here know the wilderness of unbelief. They are keenly aware that there are other options. They exist in the matrix of belief and ambiguities. Ambiguities will not be left behind. They are the reality. And as a result, these men and women exist both inside and outside the church. It may be that the goal is to find the answers, though not many Google agers would dispute that, but the means, at any rate, is clear. One must know the questions inside and out. One must know the questions inside and out. It's like charting through um, territory where you don't know what port this blue boat home of ours is going to land in. It's an adventure in which we don't know where the final destination is. And yet we are left in charge to transmit our values, our ideals, our principles to the next generation. So I'm just going to end with this quote by Antoine de Saint-Exupéry, who says that it is needful for all of us to transmit our password from one generation to another. <laughs> our password. Have we not found a password here inside the walls of this church? Lee's going to talk a little bit about her story of transformation. Each of us have found that transformation. How can we relay this password so that we don't have to click on that silly button that says forgot password um, to the next generation? Yeah. That is the challenge that I'm going to leave all of you with this morning. Good morning on this blustery Sunday, and welcome to all the new members. We're so happy to have you join us. My name is Lee Curran, and I am married to Dan Curran. We discovered this church a year ago in December when we read about a Celtic music group playing here for the winter solstice. This was after having lived in Hawaii for over 20 years. Talk about showing up late for the party. <laughs> Since discovering and becoming members of the church, we have become involved in many activities. On second Sundays, I am a greeter, and Dan is a parker. We are part of the book club. Dan is part of the buildings and ground team 
and we often participate in the work parties. When asked to speak about what this church means to me, the first thing that popped into my head wasn't any of those activities or the many wonderful people we have become connected to in the church community. What has most profoundly impacted my life is the realization that life is a balance of joys and sorrows. During the service, when we are asked to put out a hand representing our sorrows, and then a hand to represent our joys, and then bring them together to represent the balance and the quality of the interwovenness of these two, I never fail to have an aha moment. Mm -hmm. I am grateful that I have led a very wonderful life, mostly devoid of sorrow. More than one person has told me that I lead a charmed life. I kind of think of myself as a Mr. Magoo type person, myopically seeing only the good stuff and rather oblivious to the bad. That was always my favorite cartoon as a kid. I guess I just kind of connected with them. When our youngest son dropped out of college, on the mainland three years ago and returned home to live with us, the bottom fell out of my charmed life. <laughs> Without getting into too much detail, our son Finn came home addicted to prescription painkillers. His addiction pretty much decimated our family in so many ways. I discovered I lacked the tools to deal with the daily sorrows, yeah. profound sadness, guilt, loneliness, isolation, and financial burden of his addiction. I found it hard to reconcile that my life could be filled with such utter despair. Just when things were hitting rock bottom, we discovered the church, and I discovered that I could reconcile these two seemingly disparate emotions, joy and sorrow. They no longer have to be mutually exclusive of each other in my life. The church has brought me this enlightenment, and as I share and participate in the church community, I am empowered by all of your generosity of spirit, and I feel very supported in my journey. Thank you, all of you.